Ko e awau, mōrena koutou, kā nui te mihi ki a koutou kua whakarau i ka mai i tēnei ata, i runga i tēnei kaupapa whakahirahira. Hoi anō, ko riro mā tēnei hei whakatūwhera i tō tātou hui ki te karakia. Nā reira, kia taunga mana ki tanga te mea ngaro, ki runga ki tēnā ki tēnā o tātou. Kia mā hea, te hua mā kihikihi ki a toi te kupu, Toi te mana, toi te aroha, toi te reo Māori, kia tūturu ka whakamaua, kia tīnā. Tēnā. Hau mie, hui e, tāi. Tāi ki e. Kia ora tātou. Kei a koe, Manpreet. Mō rena tātou. Kā mi kia tātou. Kā mi Holden for starting us off with the karakia. Kia ora koutou katoa. Kō Manpreet tāmi toko wengoa. Kō kei ranga hauana a mahi a. Um, Manaki Fenwa Wahi Mahi. Hello everyone, my name is Manpri Tami and I'm a senior scientist at Manaki Fenwa Landgear Research and I'm co-leading this uh, National Science Challenge project with Holden and Te Huinga Ira Taketake o Aotearoa. If you're joining us for the first time today, um, just a very quick note, um, the National Science Challenge project's main goal is to develop a business case for um, a Te Tiriti guided national DNA reference library for Aotearoa's biodiversity. And at this stage, we're focusing on barcodes as the main um, DNA reference resource. And um, this particular Vananga series is on the considerations that we must highlight and think about as we develop this business case. And um, we've so far um, delved into a few important issues, including Māori perspectives, end use cases, as well as databases and how they can help or limit our ability to enable data sovereignty in New Zealand's unique situation. Um, before, uh, without further ado, I'm actually going to pass on over to my co-host for this, co-facilitator for this Wananga today, Dr. Lenani Walker from AUT, and I'll let her introduce herself and um, kick off the Wananga, Wananga for today. Uh, kia ora Manpreet and um, ngā mihi nui ki a koutou, um, Manpreet, Sarah and Holden for convening us today for what I think is looking, looking like a really cool session. Um, ko waio um, ki te taho toku papa, ko te whakatohi te iwi, ki te taho toku mama no tairanga ahau, i tipu ake hau ki Tāmaki Makaurau, he kairanga hau ahau ki um, te wā nanga arunui o Tāmaki Makaurau, ko Leilani Walker toku ingawa. Um, Ata marie e hoa um, good morning and welcome to this morning session. My name is Leilani Walker, I am a lecturer in biodiversity and entomology at Auckland University of Technology and in a past life I was um, part of the curatorial team for the entomology collection of the Auckland War Memorial Museum, so I'm particularly excited about the lineup of speakers we have here today, um, uh, which is going to be a bit more about the I think the nuts and bolts of current and developing processes and technologies which could be used for curating a national reference library. Um, it's also great to see a um, taxonomic spread in the range of our um, kind of speakers expertise. So some of you will be old hands at this by now. Um, and for those of you who perhaps chimed in for the first time, um, we'd just like to note that this session is recorded and will be available later. Um, we also have a packed program of talks. So, um, if you have questions, can you please put them in the chat and we'll come to them at the end um, when there will be some dedicated time for questions. Um, that said, speakers who may feel inclined may choose to respond directly to questions in the chat as well. Um, we will have one recorded talk today and I'll let you know what the plan is for questions when that comes up. Um, but I think we might as well kick off with our presentations for this morning. So I'd like to introduce um, Dr. Ange McCochran, who is a senior lecturer at the University of Waikato and leads the um, Invasomics Lab. Um, her research aims to improve our understanding of how species survive when their environment changes. And this morning, she's going to be talking a little about um, current practices around storing and sharing um, data within Aotearoa, New Zealand. So, um, Ange, I'll leave it to you. Thanks very much. Great, thank you. Just share my screen. Okay, can everybody see the screen okay? Yep. Cool. Okay, um, morena koutou. Um, to, uh, ko Ange toko ingwa, 
Uh, my name is Ange, and as Leilani said, I'm based at the University of Waikato. Um, and I want to talk to you a little bit today about current database uh, practice. So I'm going to give a bit of an introduction, and that will kind of hopefully lead into um, uh, why I'm kind of presenting the results that I'm going to present today. So as we know, I probably don't have to convince anybody on this call, escalating biodiversity and biosecurity concerns are a global threat. Um, and one of the keys to sort of preserving, restoring and preventing uh, invasive species, for example, and also biodiversity declines, is having a way to measure um, our biodiversity, right? We can't kind of fix or prevent or, or, or manage uh, ecosystems without being able to understand the diversity that we have that's present now and also a way to detect how it's changing over time, whether that's with biodiversity decline or with the incursions of uh, new invasive species. So we need to catalogue and detect change. Um, and genetic data, including environmental DNA, for example, can really help us to do that. And in Aotearoa, New Zealand, our biodiversity is unique. It underlies our mori ora or our well-being. So we have this idea that with thriving uh, nature, we have thriving people and that those two concepts are uniquely uh, interlinked. So our ecosystems, our species and their DNA are all treasured. And so what I wanted to, to, to find out and what the purposes of, of the results that I'm going to present to you today came off of a discussion that I had with Manpreet. We were talking about this project, the, the idea of trying to, to develop a database that works in a, in a titiriti-led Aotearoa context. And we sort of thought, well, we kind of need to establish a baseline ourselves. Like how are, how are researchers currently storing and sharing genetic data uh, in databases um, for um, Aotearoa collected samples right now? And so that's where this project uh, comes in. And so collaborators on the project include Manpreet, as you see pictured here, and also two master's students uh, in my group. So we've got Paige Matheson pictured on the left, who may be on today's call, I'm not sure, uh, and also Stasha Bird in the middle. And what I'm going to present to you uh, today is the results that uh, Paige has been accumulating in the last couple of months. So the methods that we've used is we picked two of the main kind of uh, public uh, database repositories for genetic data, BOLS, the Barcode of Life data system, which predominantly houses mitochondrial uh, cytochrome C oxidase subunit 1 or CO1 data, and then NCBI, which is the National Centre for Biotechnology Information Database, also known as GenBank. Um, and that one houses really any genetic, genomic, transcriptomic uh, type data. And what we did was we extracted all of the data that was classified as being collected in New Zealand um, for, for this project. And as well as that, we sent some emails to a couple of authors, which I'll go through the results of a bit later on to kind of get a better understanding of some of the, of the work that they had done in consulting with iwi and some of the challenges that had been associated with that. So within bold, we simply searched for New Zealand in the public data portal search bar. And we removed any overlap because there's some uh, talk between GenBank and Bold. So we re removed anything from Bold that was mined from GenBank. So we would already detect in our separate GenBank analysis. And that left us with about 38,000 records to look at. Within NCBI, we searched for country equals New Zealand in the search bar for the nucleotides database. Uh, we decided to remove microbial records that made up a significant proportion of the database. Uh, and we also removed all records from one single study, which is nearly 200,000 odd records for a single um, species, the European hedgehog. And we didn't really want that to skew the data set, so we took that one out as well. And that left us with uh, just over um, 287,000 uh, records to, to trawl through. So in terms of results, I'm going to first start off by looking at kind of the broad trends that we pulled out of the out of um, all of these records of samples that have been collected uh, in New Zealand. And the first one was looking at data types, and this only really relates to the NCBI um, database because obviously um, Bold is mostly focusing on CO1. Whereas in NCBI, the majority of data were actually labeled fairly generically as just genomic DNA. So you can see there that 74% of the samples were just kind of really generically um, labelled with no further data in the gene or organelle fields. 
And the, the purpose of kind of looking at these trends was kind of trying to identify some of the gaps. So the next question we were interested in was whether there was any taxonomic bias across databases. And indeed there was in the bold database. It's probably not too surprising uh, that it is really dominated by arthropods. You know, CO1 is a very good barcoding gene for insects. And so that's perhaps not too surprising, but 84% of all records in bold uh, correspond to arthropods. And then in NCBI, we have nearly 60% of the records corresponding to chordates. Our plants, for example, were not represented well in either database. So we have a really uh, significant taxonomic bias uh, across both of these databases in terms of what uh, samples are being collected uh, from New Zealand and deposited in these um, databases. This next um, graph sort of shows you some trends over time, and I don't actually particularly trust these trends, I'll tell you why in a second, but they generally increase that there's like decreases and increases in the amount of data being lodged across time. Um, and this may be accurate um, in terms of giving us a bit of a view of activity of singular researchers and how uh, invested, um, how much investment they were putting into um, their particular perhaps PhD project. Um, but it's unlikely to be accurate for NCBI because in this case, 92% of, of samples that are lodged on NCBI and assigned as New Zealand collected actually lacked any temporal information. So that's another pretty big gap in that a lot of um, samples are on there without actually giving this kind of background information that may be useful for repurposing the data towards other studies in the future, right? Um, in terms of uh, collector information, we were interested in asking whether or not individuals that had collected or at least deposited the data onto the public database uh, had provided their names. And in bold, 87% provided the collector name and 99.9% .9 provided their collecting institute. And of those institutes, we were sort of interested where are people that are depositing New Zealand collected data located? And seven of the top 10 institutes were based in New Zealand. And you might be able to spy on this list, your favorite institute. Um, you, I can see my university is in the, in the top five there, and I'm pretty sure I know who that was. <laughs> um, in terms of NCBI, there was sort of less information available on collecting um, author or the collector themselves. Uh, so 61% showed um, uh, lodged the author of the associated manuscript uh, alongside their data. And sometimes you had author and collector noted, or sometimes just the collector noted, but 37% of the records had no information about that at all. And there was no, there is no metadata field provided to, to put in your institution on NCBI. Moving now to look at more species specific um, trends. Overall, uh, we could see that the bold database lacked species level data. So when people could put in the information of the taxonomic rank of their species, 62% uh, were not species uh, were not identified down to the species level. Uh, only 38% were. And in NCBI, uh, the converse was true. We had 98% sequence to the actual species level for these New Zealand collected samples. So another area where we have big gaps in the databases, right? And this is something obviously that the, this initiative is working towards trying to, to address in the future. Uh, we were interested in looking at for those species that were classified down to species level, how many of them were endemic and how many of them were uh, not endemic. And in the bold database, we had about 60% that um, of those species uh, identified to species level that were endemic to New Zealand. And in NCBI, that corresponded to 51%. And then what we did was have a quick look at the top 10 species lists in both databases. So the top 10 species in bold accounted for 5% of the total records of New Zealand collected samples, and of them, nine were endemic species. And then we just had this one uh, scavenger beetle um, native to Europe in that top 10 list. And then in the NCBI database, the top 10 species accounted for 91% of the total New Zealand collected records. Uh, and they were dominated by Titipunamu, uh, the rifleman. Um, and there was a, a mix of different uh, invasives and non-native um, and endemic species in that top 10 list. We, as I mentioned, we sent emails out to, to authors uh, and we picked, for those authors, we picked the endemic species um, that were in our top 10 lists. 
And we, we didn't get a great response from those emails, but they were kind of informative, the responses that we did get. So both of the people uh, that responded had projects that were looking at uh, stream invertebrates uh, and titi punamu. Uh, both of those projects required doc permissions and they involved contact with tangata whenua. Uh, however, neither of them had any funding to support that contact with iwi. And the authors identified as barriers that there was limited availability of iwi kaimahi or workers um, that that had um, that were identified as having rele relevant expertise, um, and that there was skepticism among iwi uh, of the researchers' motives. So those were identified as some barriers from those from those authors. So looking forwards, um, I, I think the the whole idea of this. Um, project was really to identify some of the gaps and use them to be able to use them to inform um, the, the development of a New Zealand Tithiriti-led um, database moving forwards. Um, so we identified biodiversity gaps. As I, as we saw there, there's taxonomic breadth gaps, there's um, de uh, gaps in, in, in terms of the quality of the data that's available and things like that. And as we probably all know on this call, building up the databases is going to require collective efforts um, to, to address some of these biodiversity gaps. In addition, there were really key infrastructure gaps. Um, and it's clear that these are preventing or at least not facilitating data stewardship. Um, so there weren't even fields for um, being able to uh, insert certain types of, of information. And um, in fact, we, we downloaded more than 300,000 records, but 88% of data was not even accompanied by uh, a specified country of origin in these databases. And so, of course, we will have missed uh, a lot of records um, because of that. And so um, missing data fields, missing metadata fields uh, is a really big uh, gap that needs addressing when we think about designing our own potential infrastructure moving forwards. Uh, we need to see better uptake of the existing fields, the, the fields for metadata that are available. And we also need to add in additional metadata fields, um, for example, for cultural authorities. Uh, and you might be familiar with some of the biocultural and traditional knowledge notices and labels. Um, so these types of um, of um, measures are, are a key way of, of adding in cultural authority information. We also um, could potentially look at providing areas for collection consents, for example. And finally, there are resource and people gaps. Um, so we clearly need better resourcing to overcome barriers and foster engagement in equitable outcomes. And researchers also need to work towards overcoming well-founded mistrust amongst our iwi. So coming back full circle to what I sort of started with, if we're looking forwards, we know that genetic tools can aid in the safeguarding of biodiversity and, and contribute to the health of our people and our tile. Um, but we need to be careful and we need to think about using these types of information to inform the best uh, approach um, moving forwards. And so that's me, Namihi Nui. Thank you for your attention and I'll be glad to um, chat more uh, and I'm really looking forward to hearing what the other speakers have to say as well. Thanks. Kia ora, Ange. That was really that was really interesting. I think um, it it says a lot about um, what what stories it's possible to tell with the databases in their current state versus perhaps what we'd ideally like them to be able to achieve. So really really nice way to kick off. Thank you. Um, our next speaker is um, uh, Dr. De, um, Andrew Depider, um, who is a researcher in the biocontrol and molecular ecology team at Manaki Fenua. Um, Andrew has developed a process to obtain DNA barcodes from um, many hundreds of invertebrates simultaneously, which is um, important because of how biodiverse um, they are. I will just hand it across to you, Andrew, if you're happy to share your slides. Thank you. Okay, um, kia ora koutou. Um, firstly, I'll just say I had a dig into database coverage of New Zealand invertebrates as well recently. Um, the New Zealand Organisms Register lists about 17,000 terrestrial arthropod species. Um, and according to what I found, um, approximately 80% of these do not have an existing DNA barcode in either GenBank or BOLD. Um, 
so clearly there's quite a lot to do in terms of um, increasing database coverage of New Zealand's invertebrate biodiversity. Um, arguably one contributing factor to that is that um, most DNA barcodes generated to, to date have been generated using a process called Sanger sequencing, um, which was developed in 1977 by Frederick Sanger. And it's still used today because it's a great method. Um, it's accurate and it um, can produce sequences up, of up to about 800 base pairs long. And this is good for DNA barcoding because the usual animal DNA barcode length is 650 base pairs of DNA. Um, however, um, the efficiency and scalability of this technique is inherently limited because a separate sequencing reaction is required to generate a DNA sequence from each specimen. Um, in contrast, a variety of so-called next generation or second generation DNA sequencing systems have um, been developed in the past decade or so. Um, and the common feature of these systems is that a very large number of DNA sequences can be generated simultaneously and in parallel from a mixed pool of input DNA molecules. Um, each sequencing, each of these systems does this a bit differently. Um, there's quite a bit of competition between these different methods to try and sort of develop the best approach, I guess. Um, but overall, this makes these systems much more flexible and scalable because you can sequence a lot of stuff in one go and it tends to be cheaper um, in terms of the cost per sequence output than Sanger sequencing. <clears throat> However, there can be some upfront costs which are more expensive. Um, the dominant approach, or well, the dominant of the most dominant of these systems today is probably Illumina sequencing. Um, and the reason why it's dominant is that because it is because it has massive output in terms of it can produce millions to billions of sequences with high accuracy and sensitivity. Um, but it does have one limitation, which can be inconvenient sometimes, and that is that the read lengths it produces are quite short. So, um, Sanger, I mean, sorry, Illumina sequencing produces, or typically produces two sequence reads per molecule. It takes one read from one end of a DNA molecule and a second read from the other end of the DNA molecule. Um, these are typically called R1 and R2 reads. Um, if these reads are long enough to cover the full piece of DNA being sequenced, then they can be joined together into into a into one full length DNA sequence. Um, however, if the piece of DNA to be sequenced is too is longer than these combined reads, then um, that's not the case. Um, anyway, the, the, the length of these R1 and R2 reads is at most 300 base pairs each. So if you join two of those together, then you get a maximum read length of about just under 600 base pairs. And you'll notice that's actually less than the um, typical length of the animal CO1 DNA barcode, which is 600 base pairs. So that's a bit of an issue, but fortunately we can get around that. Um, these are some of the currently available Illumina DNA sequencing platforms available. Um, they vary wildly in the terms of sequence data they output. So the um, iSeq 100, I think, can produce about 4 million or so DNA sequences. At the other extreme, the next seek and some other things that aren't actually shown on there can produce like 50 billion DNA sequence reads per sequence run, which is kind of mind blowing. Um, the system that we are most interested in, the most use and use most commonly, however, is um, the MySeq, which is sort of the middle of the range, and that produces about 25 million sequence reads. But importantly, it has the maximum read length of all these um, Illumina systems of two by 300 base pairs. So um, how do we actually use, use the system to DNA barcode invertebrates? Um, well, firstly, you do some DNA extractions from invertebrate specimens. Um, and then the key thing is we can do a PCR for two um, overlapping pieces of the CO1 barcode region. So, and we call these FC and BR. And these two regions um, shown in green and orange actually overlap. So we can join them together in theory to produce a full CO1 barcode out the other end of the process. Um, we attach a molecular label to the FC and BR amplicon so we can match them back to the specimen they came from. And then we pull it all together and throw it into a MySeq system, MySeq run. Um, what's happening? Sorry, my 
PowerPoint seems to have paused. There we go. Um, so at the other end, we get 25 million or so DNA sequence reads. Um, we demultiplex all that per specimen. It just means working out which sequence reads derived from which specimen. Um, we merge the R1 and R2 reads um, from the FC and the BR sequences separately. Um, so then we get a merged FC sequence and a merged BR sequence. Then we do some filtering for errors and whatnot. And then finally, we can assemble the FC and the BR into full barcodes. Um, so we tried this process with um, a collection of 450 invertebrate specimens. Um, this consisted mainly of earthworms and a, an assortment of beetles and wasps. Um, also, they were up to about 20 years old, the specimens, and they were the DNA was extracted using several different methods. Um, and before I get to the results, some things we noticed during the processing of the data um, were we thought that the initially thought that the most abundant sequence from each specimen would be the correct barcode, but that actually proved not to be the case in about up to a third of cases. Um, so we had to develop a complex um, data filtering process to pick out the correct barcodes from each specimen. And this involved looking, assigning a taxonomic identity to the most abundant sequences, and then um, using that basis to pick out which barcode was the likely correct one, and then trying to merge those two, the FC and BR ones, fragments with the correct taxonomy together based on um, whether they aligned correctly or not. Um, we observed varying very consistent um, recovery of the BR fragment, but much more varied recovery of the FC um, fragment among different taxa, suggesting there was an issue with the primers used to piece generate the FC fragment. Um, the outcomes were quite uh, impressive, I thought. Um, we obtained full length Cohen barcodes for 349 of the 40, 450 specimens. Um, now that's comparable to um, probably the um, a successful, a decently successful Sanger sequencing, batch of sequencing, but it's a much, much bigger, higher number of specimens. Um, this included 146 full DNA barcodes from uh, PCRs that showed no hint of a band on a gel at all. So though we can assume that those probably wouldn't have worked using Sanger sequencing. So that sort of points to the sensitivity of this process as being advantageous. Um, as I said, there were <clears throat> a number of specimens where we lacked, we didn't find an FC sequence read, um, and it was higher than the number that we didn't find a BR sequence read. So there was probably a problem um, or something to be improved in terms of the PCRs for the FC fragment to uh, maximize the, the success of this process. Um, however, in total, if we count up all the full and partial barcodes, we got something back from 98% um, of the specimens, which is a very high rate of success in terms of DNA barcoding. Um, I compared some of these Illumina sequences with Sanger barcodes from the same specimens to try and see if they were doing the same the same thing. Um, there were 68 specimens that have got a bar full barcode from both methods. Um, Illumina MySeq only, well, there were 16 which only got a barcode from Illumina MySeq. Um, there were 10 specimens where I had a full Sanger sequence, but only a partial Illumina barcode sequence. But um, the Sanger sequences, it has to be noted, were generated after with quite a bit of PCR optimization um, and repeated attempts to generate the barcode. Um, there were no cases where I only got a Sanger barcode. Um, the identity of most of these sequences that I got a barcode from both methods from was 100% um, from in most cases. Although there were a few cases where it was quite, they were quite different, suggesting that one or other process had amplified a barcode from the wrong thing. Um, this is a phylogeny of all the DNA barcodes recovered in that process. Um, so most of them are beetles and worms. The earthworms are the blue, the beetles are the, um, the yellow color. Um, this has all been published in an um, open access article, which you can um, read if you want more details of the process. 
Um, and I should also mention some other possibilities for generating um, large numbers of DNA barcodes that have recently become available. Um, one is the Oxford Nanopore system. Um, now this uses quite a different process to generate sequences, but the most important or most notable thing is that it's available in quite low cost and portable devices about the size of a, size of a, a cell phone. Um, so this um, enables in theory, well, actually it's been done now in the field identification of species using DNA barcodes. And um, with the right setup, it can also be used to barcode hundreds of thousands of species in one sort of attempt. Um, and then we've got PAC Bio Smart sequen sequel Sequencing, um, which was used a couple of years ago to generate um, barcodes from a high proportion of about 10,000 specimens. Um, <clears throat> However, this system is a bit more, uh, well, less accessible and seems to be more costly than the aluminum iSeq approach, um, in my, as far as I'm aware. Um, both these systems produce longer sequence reads than aluminum sequencing, however, but that was at the expense of high, um, higher error rates or lower accuracy as a rule until recently. Um, so just to conclude, um, uh, we think our process with the, the aluminum iSeq is um, efficient, accurate, sensitive, and, sensitive and scalable. Um, so that um, is a powerful approach, I think, for generating more efficient or more efficiently generating barcode, barcode sequences on a large scale. Um, it seems to be effective for a wide range of invertebrate taxa. Um, we theorized that the maximum capacity of it might be uh, 10,000 specimens and sequences per sequencing run. Um, but that remains to be tested. And we also theorize that it could be adaptable to different barcode loci. For example, if we want to um, barcode more uh, older specimens with more degraded DNA, perhaps we can adapt this for shorter pieces of um, uh, the DNA sequence. Um, and that's me. Thank you for listening. Dora, Andrew, thank you for that. Um, sounds like a really exciting and promising way forward for um, efficient sequencing. Um, I'm just thinking about if you could, if indeed you can get 10,000 specimens through on a single run, that's pretty incredible. Um, mm. I also like that um, your talk touches a bit on um, the resource of existing collections, um, which I believe our next speaker will be picking up on. Um, so uh, I'm pleased to introduce... Um, Dr. Gert Jan Yernan, um, he was a postdoctoral research fellow at the University of Targo. Um, he has an interest in spatial and temporal resolution for aquatic environmental DNA, eDNA. Um, but today he's going to be talking a bit about um, the software, which can be used to build and evaluate local reference databases, um, as well as, as I said, picking up on um, the non-destructive sampling of museum specimens to fill in some of those gaps that we're aware of. So um, I'll hand over to you. Um, is this working? At all? Yeah, perfect. Okay. Um, hello, everyone. My name is Gert Jan Jönen, and I'm a research fellow at the University of Otago. And today I'll be talking about how to build your own reference database and how we can use museum specimens to fill some of these barcoding gaps that currently exist. Um, so I think most of us have realized by now the potential of eDNA surveys um, to help us monitor our natural environment across the tree of life with relatively minimal efforts compared to traditional approaches. And this potential stems from the taxonomy assignment, which is based on matching environmental sequences to a barcode reference database. So we don't have to visually observe all of our organisms anymore. However, this potential is also linked to a current limitation, um, which is that those reference databases that are used for taxonomy assignments are currently incomplete. And this hinders robust taxonomy assignment and can lead to miss and over classification. So to explain this a bit more, we can look at this very simple example of um, a family of fish where we have the red genus and the blue genus, both with two species. If we were to collect some water samples for our eDNA analysis and the dark red fish would be in our stream, we're picking up the DNA of that red fish from our water sample. 
if we were to have a barcode for all four species within this family, the current classification algorithms that we have access to these days, they'll be able to very accurately tell us which species is um, belongs to the eDNA signal. However, because these reference databases are incomplete, a more realistic example is that, for example, we only have the barcode for a, the bluefish. So the current classifiers, because there is missing information, they don't really know what kind of taxonomic ID our sequence should be. And this is where misidentification and overclassification can occur. So to help us um, gain a bit more understanding and show us the prevalence of this uh, potential problem, we've developed two software programs. Um, the first one is called CRABS, which allows you to build your own local reference database. And it does this using um, a certain workflow. So with the program, you can download sequencing data from online repositories such as NCBI, Bolt, EMBL, and MitoFish. You can then extract from that downloaded sequence data your amplicon that you're interested for your eDNA analysis through in silico PCR analysis. So it's trying to find those primer binding regions from that downloaded data and extract the amplicon region out. Sometimes those primer binding regions are not available. So we can use those extracted amplicons as seed sequences in a pairwise global alignment to try and build a more, most complete reference database as possible. You can then use various filtering parameters to clean up that database so that you have a locally stored, a curated custom reference database for your eDNA study. And this software can be used for any taxonomic group and any um, gene region that you would be interested in. The second software that we are currently developing and that are, is close to being finished is called Optimus Primer. And this allows you to compare and explore different reference databases and different primer sets so that you can have a informed decision on what might be the best option for your eDNA study using different kinds of functionalities. So we can look at an example of the reference database for Southern Ocean Fish for the 16S gene, just to show you how this might work. Um, the reason that we are looking at Southern Ocean Fish is because that's mainly what um, I'm working on currently, but you can do this for any gene region and any taxonomic group and any location. So first we build our reference database, which you can store locally on your own computer uh, using CRABS. And then we are using Optimus Primer to run different kinds of analyses. The first thing that we can look at, for example, is a barcode gap analysis. And this is to see how complete the database is for the taxonomic group of interest. So in our case, we have around 1400 described fish and shark species for the Southern Ocean. And uh, what we can see here is that roughly 40% of those species have a reference barcode currently available in our database. So even for very well studied taxonomic groups like fish, um, less than 50% currently have genetic information available, which is a big problem. Another analysis that we can look at is taxonomic resolution. So trying to determine at which level the taxonomy can be assigned for the amplicon. And this is based on sequence similarity and genetic distance calculations. So if you were to have your eDNA sequence, can we assign this to a species level because every species has a unique barcode, which is what you would hope for, or do we need to assign this to a genus level because all species within that genus have the same barcode? For our 16S gene, what we can see is that for the majority, um, it is species specific, which is a good thing. Another aspect that we can look at is amplification efficiency. So this is determining the probability of successful amplification um, in your PCR reaction. So this is based on thermodynamic calculations and mismatches in your primer binding regions. So in our example for our 16S primers, which are um, located here uh, for the forward and reverse primer, we can see what the um, similarity is with our primer binding regions, which is quite high in our case. However, we can see on our tree prime end right over here that we have a G2A mutation, which is specific for sharks. And this um, is an explanation on why this primer set is not great at amplifying shark DNA. Then one other analysis that we can run is amplification specificity. So determine co-amplification um, issues of non-target taxa, which is known to reduce amplification success for target organisms. So if you are interested in describing the fish diversity in your eDNA sample, you're using a primer set that 
is targeted for fish, but also amplifies a huge range of other taxonomic groups, we know that there is an increased risk of false negative detections. And this kind of analysis can help you explore that is potential issue. So based on these examples, um, I hope I uh, shown you um, the power of these software programs to help you explore your own reference databases and build your own reference database. So what we've seen here, especially for the barcode gap analysis, is that a lot of these reference barcodes are currently missing, which is what the previous two speakers have talked about as well. And um, filling these barcode gaps is essential for achieving robust taxonomy assignment. And we can use museum specimens um, to do this, which are a highly valuable resource for several different reasons. The first is that those specimens are cataloged, so they have a catalog number associated with them. If we have a barcode or if we use get genetic information from that specimen, we can link that genetic information to the catalog number. And this allows us to re-examine either the specimen or the genetic information at a future date if needed. Second is that um, most of these specimens already have a taxonomic ID associated with them. And this is based on morphological characteristics. So this allows us to circumvent the need to find experts to try and do this for newly collected specimens. And then third, what we can uh, say for museum specimens is that it circumvents the need for us to go into the field, collect more organisms, which can be very costly and also destructive for the environment. So this is something that Andrew already talked about before, but so the traditional way of doing this is um, for barcoding is cutting off a small um, tissue biopsy from a specimen and using Sanger sequencing for um, generating that barcode. However, these days we also have access to next generation sequencing technologies. So we, not get, so we can not only look at the barcode, but also look at all of the historical eDNA that might be present in your specimens using a meta barcoding approach. And this is some of the research that we are focusing on in our lab group, specifically for sponges. So marine sponges, they filter water as a feeding strategy. And as a byproduct, they naturally accumulate eDNA. So if we were to look at um, historical sponges that are stored in museum collections, such as uh, the Niwa and Vertebrate collection, um, and we're using a CO1 barcoding approach, so using those CO1 barcodes, primers, that amplify not only the sponge DNA, but all eukaryote DNA. If we're um, working together with a next generation sequencing approach, we can recover the barcode for all of those sponges, but we can also look at the diversity of the eDNA that is contained within these sponges. So not only do we have the barcodes, all of the diversity that was present around those sponges when they were collected, we can look at and investigate as well. And we've been able to do this for um, specimens that are stored in various ways, including ethanol, frozen, and dried. And this allows us to try and look at temporal patterns. Then the final thing that I wanted to talk about is the destructiveness. So normally you would use those tissue biopsies for DNA extraction. Um, however, museum specimens are highly valuable and a finite resource. You can't keep cutting them up and they can't be recollected. So non-destructive sampling is therefore preferred. And we've shown that this is feasible both for barcoding and metabarcoding approaches. So here we have an Antarctic sponge that is stored in ethanol. And when we are extracting the DNA from the ethanol and from the sponge tissue, we can get the same barcode and we can also get the same metabarcoding information. So we showed that uh, for metabarcoding, for example, you can get near identical fish community structure that was first housed as historical eDNA in these sponges. So to conclude, um, reference databases are essential for robust taxonomy assignments. Um, I think we've developed two software programs that are quite easy to use to help you build and explore your own reference databases so that you can get the most out of your eDNA study. Museum specimens are a highly valuable resource to fill barcoding gaps. But when linking this to next generation sequencing technologies, we can not only barcode them, but also look at the diversity that is present within these specimens and explore past ecosystem states. And finally, we can say that um, non-destructive DNA extractions are feasible from the preservative medium that these specimens are stored in. So I'd like to thank all of our funding sources and our amazing eDNA team. Thank you very much. 
Kia ora, Gatian. Um, I'm just struck by the elegance of um, the idea of using natural environmental DNA collected like sponges and then that being compounded by extraction from storage solution. What a um, wonderful approach. Um, our next speaker is um, Dr. Rob Miss, uh, uh, Smithson, um, sorry, uh, who is a senior researcher and botanist in the systematics team at Manaki Whenua. Um, his interests are in taxonomy and evolution of New Zealand plants, and today we'll be talking about uh, barcoding green plants, which after Andrew's talk, um, first up, we know uh, um, seems particularly pertinent given how poorly represented they are in existing but databases. Are you here, Rob? I'm, I'm here. I'm, I'm just fighting with screens. Sorry, give me a moment. No problem. <laughs> there you are. Okay. Uh, right. Uh, yes. So um, a somewhat different perspective, perhaps. And yes. So why why are green plants uh, so uh, are poorly represented in uh, barcoding databases um, and so on? Um, well, uh, one way of looking at this is, is to look at the uh, uh, genetic markers that have been used for barcoding uh, plants. <clears throat> uh, and uh, a major one is the nuclear ribosomal DNA uh, repeat region, or, or one of them technically, but we'll just call it that. Uh, good thing about this particular bit of DNA is it's uh, in high copy number in organisms, so it's relatively easy to... Uh, assay from uh, small or uh, old samples. Um, uh, in this case, yes, it's, it's present in high copy number because highly repeated uh, at uh, one or more uh, locus within the nuclear genome, uh, and that, that's both good and bad. Um, it's also subject to um, quite commonly non-functional copies that persist. So uh, although in a barcoding context, we think of these as having a sequence, it's really an average sequence of um, a, um, a repeated piece of DNA that can be variable within genomes. The, the other source of markers for DNA barcoding in plants uh, is the plastid, uh, often referred to as chloroplast, uh, more generically better called a plastid. Um, and particular genes or regions within the plastid genome. So the plastid genome is also in high copy number by virtue of the fact that uh, plastids uh, occur in multiple, uh, that, well, there are multiple plastid organelles within uh, plant cells, uh, and each plastid also has um, uh, quite often a, a very high number of copies of its, of its chromosome. Um, so that, again, makes it quite easy to assay uh, as a function of that copy number. Uh, it's usually modelled, and, and reasonably so, as a single linkage. So all the genes have tend to have uh, a, a close, uh, closely similar evolutionary history, and that's useful because you can sequence more and more uh, and add them together, and you should generally be recovering the same uh, uh, history. Um, in many plants, they're maternally inherited. There are lots of exceptions. Um, I'm not, I'm, I'm most of what I'm talking about is going to be uh, land plants, but uh, it's important to note that there's a lot of diversity of green algae out there. Um, for barcoding green algae, uh, mostly um, 18S uh, DNA, which is part of this um, uh, tandem repeat uh, unit. Is, is the most commonly used piece of DNA. Within green plants, there's a lot of variation in uh, the sort of architecture of uh, plastids, uh, which is potentially problematic in, in, in using them at higher, um, across a, 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 the full diversity of, of green plants. But that, that is also an option. Uh, what I think would really be a sort of a bit of a holy grail is to use low copy nuclear genes instead of these. Um, some people call these single copy nuclear genes, but um, uh, they're, they're very often not in single copy. So, so that's, it's better to refer to them as low copy number. Um, there are of course thousands of these and some of them are very variable compared with the other bits of DNA. So one of the impediments to 
um, uh, successful plant DNA barcoding is that uh, plastid DNA in particular is not particularly fast evolving. Um, and um, the um, normal regions of the uh, nuclear ribosomal DNA are quite short. So um, there's not always enough information there. Um, but yeah, genuinely single copy genes can be very hard to find. And some plants don't have any, so that's a problem. Um, there can be a lot of allelic variation, even within a diploid um, uh, uh, plant uh, species or an individual. And so that has to be uh, accounted for. It's difficult to amplify these uh, from PCR um, using universal primers. Uh, quite often the gene architecture is not preserved, so there are uh, different exons and introns and so on, and they're not necessarily uh, located together and things. But even more so, conserved primer sites within genes is, is problematic uh, for generation of universal primers. And, pretty much not aware of any that, that, that work across uh, green plants or even a subset such as land plants or angiosperms. Um, but nuclear genes can be assayed using other methods uh, and targeted enrichment is one that people use a lot, although not so much in the barcoding context at this time, but that they, they can allow for sampling of, of multiple low copy nuclear genes. Uh, people have gone over the technologies a little bit already. Uh, so yes, PCR and Sanger sequencing. So that's usually fairly small fragments of DNA have been uh, historically used. Um, genome skimming is a, is a method that people quite often use in plants, which is uh, a, a sort of uh, using a sledgehammer to crash and crush a nut uh, approach where you just sequence the whole genome and then you just uh, filter out these highly repeated sequences, such as the nuclear ribosomal DNA and the plastid DNA. Um, it's a bit inefficient because uh, you're throwing away 95% of your data for your sequencing, but uh, because the sequencing machines are so efficient now, that, that that's a workable thing in some contexts. Uh, another approach is the amplicon sequencing, uh, which um, Andrew's uh, talk discuss, um, that, that can also be be used in, in plants, of course. Uh, and, and a fourth approach is, as I mentioned before, targeted enrichment, um, which is, um, I won't go into the, the details of how you do it, but it's essentially a fishing expedition uh, where you uh, use probes to pull out uh, matching pieces of DNA from, from a shotgun uh, sequence library and sequence those. And that can be very, that can be very efficient and can, uh, allow you to assemble relatively long pieces of DNA. The big problem though with plants is this uh, DNA barcoding gap that's already been mentioned. Um, so this is the sort of classic uh, DNA barcoding assumption, if you like. Um, and it fails in a lot of plant groups. Um, and um, it, it's, uh, yeah, um, Probably the, the the biggest reason why um, uh, a lot of uh, botanists are, are not super keen on the barcoding approach. So you get um, uh, more variation often within species than between species, or at least overlap uh, in that. So that that makes it difficult to use the barcodes as as a reliable proxy for for relationships. So examples of that, just to sort of demonstrate that this isn't um, simply a matter of oversplitting uh, by taxonomists or whatever. On the uh, left of this slide, we have two very different looking plants, um, Leucogenes tarahoa from um, endemic to um, the Taraha range uh, here in Canterbury, where I am. Uh, and below that, Raulia eximia, uh, a vegetable sheep species. Uh, so they share the same um, nuclear ribosomal DNA barcode, is, essentially. So two very different looking things, two different species, clearly, um, but they can't be distinguished uh, by their, by their um, nRDNA barcodes. Um, the other side of the problem is you can have a single species, such as this one here, another New Zealand Edelweiss species with Cogenese brandiceps, uh, and the tree on the right um, shows... Um, uh, some, uh, again, nuclear ribosomal DNA sequences 
uh, from that species, showing that there's a lot of diversity uh, within that species. As, now, it's, it's, it's possible that we're missing something, um, there's cryptic species there, but, but um, that really, that, that doesn't seem to be the case. So what we have is a species in which there are quite different sequences coexisting, uh, and sometimes found together and sometimes uh, found separately with, within that species. So um, basically the problem is that sequences don't sit nicely within species. That's less common with nuclear ribosomal DNA species uh, sequences, which is why people often prefer them. It's very common with plastid sequences, but it does occur with both. Uh, here's uh, another example, um, uh, genus Formium, uh, two species, Harakeki and Farariki. Um, there are two quite nice plastid sequences, uh, at least if you sequence enough plastid DNA at, at the genome level, there are two nice clades, but they don't correspond at all with the species. They do, there is some geographic pattern to them. Uh, Harakeki from the South Island tends to have this clade B sequence. Uh, Harakeki from the North Island, the clade A sequence, um, etc. But um, they can't be used uh, no matter how you assay them to distinguish the species. Um, and that isn't even counting the problem of the hybrids between the two species. So I think it's useful to distinguish between global and local DNA barcoding exercises. And this is um, uh, a terrastylus orchid, um, which is pollinated by fungus gnats. And so the bottom there is a... Um, a fungus gnat stuck to a gluey sheet of plastic, uh, and there's a brown smudge on its thorax, which is the pollinium of the orchid. Orchids uh, generally present their pollen as um, in, en masse, as, as, as a, um, a, a, a mass called a, a pollinium, and it's extremely dense in DNA, and so it's really nice, um, easy uh, pollination uh, barcoding kind of system because you can easily get DNA out of that pollinium stuck to the back of the uh, of the insect. Um, now, terrastylus orchids can't all be distinguished by um, uh, DNA barcodes, but uh, where you have, as is almost always the case, only a limited number within um, the range of an ecological study, you can distinguish what's what you know already is present there. So, terrastylus ursoniana can't be distinguished globally from all other terrastylus species, but it can be distinguished by barcode from other terrastylus species at Arthur's Pass where Lisa Bellwitz's study was done. And so using this approach, uh, she was able to provide some convincing evidence that um, a number of uh, sympatric terrastylus species uh, are all pollinated through um, pseudocopulation by different species of uh, fungus gnat. So there's a, a very specific, um, highly specialized pollination system in these orchids in New Zealand, which, which nobody had shown before and would have been very difficult to show any other way because you can't distinguish pollen uh, for, um, by morphology from, from the different terrestrial species. So uh, DNA barcoding is often, so, you know, very can be very useful. There are some very easy examples. Here's one that just came in as a plant ID at the Allen Herbarium where I work. Um, uh, marsh cudweed, Nephalium ligonosum. It's, it's globally a very common weed. It's quite rare in New Zealand. It's historically known only from a couple of sites on the west coast of the South Island, the purple dots on the map there. Uh, but recently one came in from Southland, some distance from the others. Um, and um, uh, yes, we, we uh, well, it came across my desk and I thought it looked a bit funny. So <laughs> um, Nephalium uliginosum is not in the keys, uh, in the floras of New Zealand, uh, because it's, it's only been known uh, from, from these few locations and hasn't been properly treated. So we did do uh, a DNA barcode uh, on this to confirm the ID. And because there's nothing else closely related to this plant in New Zealand, um, we get a very um, confident um, DNA barcoding result from that. So sometimes things are simple. Sometimes things are not. So uh, New Zealand's species of no, uh, or Lepidium, uh, a crest genus, 
are all allopolyploids. And allopolyploids are plants which have multiple copies of genomes derived from different ancestral diploid species. And so this is a bit complicated. Um, there's some pictures of continents on there to show that uh, the species in New Zealand have links to different um, continents, including Africa, the Americas, and um, maybe an indigenous Australasian uh, component as, as well. We don't know any of the ancestral diploid species of these. We don't even know any of the ancestral tetraploid species, um, which are hypothetical. The lowest chromosome number we have for a group in New Zealand is um, aploid, octoploid. So there are eight copies of the genome. Um, so the Cisimbrioides group in New Zealand, which includes a number of highly threatened plants from the high country of the South Island, has um, what I've designated in this weird diagram as a B, C, D and E genomes all coexisting. Um, but it only displays nuclear ribosomal DNA barcodes of one of those genomes. So it gives you um, uh, only only a quarter of the of, of its genome is really represented in, in that barcode. Going up uh, in, in um, the number of genomes, we have a tenploid, decaploid, um, lipidium oleraceum group, that's cooked scurvy grass and, and its cohorts. Uh, and it is derived from a cross between an African species and the uh, octoploid group, uh, so it's got A, B, C, D, and E genomes, if you like, but it only displays one barcode sequence, uh, the A group of the African uh, ancestor. So again, only, only giving you a very small part of the story. And the worst case scenario, at least that we know of, is Lepidium nofragorum, which is octodecaploid. It has 18 copies of uh, the chromosomes. Uh, and it is, uh, we believe, a uh, derived from um, a crossing between the tenploid, decaploid group and the octoploid group. And it only displays the C-type barcode. Uh, so it looks to be like a, uh, a member of the octoploid group. So this sort of polyploid evolution is very common. It's very common in New Zealand species. Apart from Lepidium, big genera like Veronica, Leptinella, Raolia, Salmisia, Oliaria, Crassula, Prosma, many grasses, all sorts of things undergo this sort of evolution. And that's a real problem. So my thoughts are that some subtlety is needed. Naive barcoding is risky. That's always going to be the case. There's no silver bullet. We need to classify before we can identify any organism group. So um, I think when DNA barcoding promises to do both uh, in, a, in a circular sort of process, um, that's, that's difficult. Um, geographic sampling can be very important because species will often vary in the DNA barcodes they display around the motu. So um, uh, for assembly reference databases, that's, that's something to consider. Uh, nuclear ribosomal DNA ITS sequences are available for most angiosperms with good vouchers through um, work from folk at Auckland University some years ago, but other groups uh, are very much less well covered. And of course, there's even fewer expert taxonomists in those. So those are a real gap. Um, our uh, naturalized and cultivated flora are hugely diverse, but uh, many of those species will be in global databases. So, so um, uh, they're, they're a gap in terms of, um, of what's here, but um, there, there will be a lot of coverage in, in international databases. So we should consider those um, uh, very carefully. Um, and I want to say the collections, in this case herbaria, are absolutely critical to reference databases for DNA. Um, uh, you know, because of taxonomic changes that occur over time, uh, we need to be able to check IDs of plants, um, you know, uh, especially um, uh, even experts make mistakes and you can revisit those if barcode and suggest something else or confirm that, in fact, something's wrong with the theory. Um, and, of course, evolving technology means that what we might settle on now is the right thing to do in terms of barcoding 
almost certainly won't be in 10 or 20 years time. So preserving uh, both the specimen and the DNA are important. And that's the sort of point made in a number of uh, recent publications, including the one cited at the bottom. And that's me, thank you. Kia ora, Rob. Um, things are never straightforward, are they? Um, and I really appreciate you raising the importance of taxonomy as a foundation or um, part of all of this. Um, so next up, we have a recorded talk talk from um, Leo Tedeso, who is um, who we're going to be talking about DNA barcoding for fungi. Um, Leo holds joint professorships at the University of Tata in Estonia and King Saud University in Saudi Arabia. Um, he's interested in fungal ecology, although his research has expanded to cover the development of novel molecular identification methods. Um, now, since he couldn't be here today, we will be playing, as I said, we'll be playing recorded talk. Um, please still feel free to submit questions through the chat, um, and they will be sent to him and his answers will be posted at a later date. But um, that's all from me. Hello, my name is Leo Dederso, and I'm a research professor in Tartu University and jointly in King Saud University. Today, I'm presenting you some tips for DNA barcoding with examples from uh, fungi. So uh, there are multiple ways to perform uh, meta barcoding, and uh, most people know how to do this in a traditional way, which has been used for more than 30 years. For fungi, the ITS region of uh, rRNA genes is the main region for uh, DNA metaparcoding in fungi. Uh, this uh, marker is used with a one-way or two-way Sanger sequencing technique for generating uh, these barcodes. Um, its downside is that uh, it is relatively uh, laborious, especially the sequence pairing, uh, quality editing, and uh, identification steps, which often need to be done one by one and manually. The um, maximum uh, length of uh, high quality Sanger read is around 900 paces, uh, usually less. Also, um, taking all uh, sequencing efforts together, Sanger sequencing is relatively costly uh, for large batches, the prices start for, start for from two euros per uh, one reaction. Uh, it is also prone to uh, contamination and uh, poor sequence quality, which means that uh, barcoding uh, reaction has principally failed. There are also uh, three new ways. Uh, of DNA barcoding, which uh, all include uh, high throughput uh, sequencing. The first of these is uh, genome uh, skimming, which is a low coverage uh, genome sequencing to recover uh, one or many marker genes and often in, in their full length. It's quite a successful method for very old specimens, including those that are more than 100 years old. It can also be used for uh, contaminated specimens and uh, environmental samples when your target uh, organism is uh, dominating or, or at least co-dominating. Uh, it is relatively costly method, uh, starting from uh, 100 euros per specimen and uh, much of the cost is related to uh, preparation of individual sequencing libraries for each uh, specimen. Um, it also uh, provides relatively inconsistent results for single copy genes. Many would be partial and others uh, missing. It is also quite laborious as it requires manual analysis and uh, verification of uh, various genes and their uh, taxonomic identity. Uh, there is a risk of database contamination because of molds and other 
sorts of uh, contaminating uh, airborne uh, fungi. Um, one of the first examples of this approach in fungi was published uh, uh, from my team, where we addressed uh, the opportunities of DNA barcoding from uh, old specimens and that particularly ectomycorrhizal root tips, which contain very little uh, materials. The th second uh, uh, method for uh, DNA barcoding using new approaches is target capture uh, sequencing, sometimes also known as uh, left sec. Um, this uh, includes uh, en enrichment of uh, those targeted uh, markers for uh, high throughput uh, sequencing. So it means that uh, sequencing depth can be much lower uh, compared with uh, genome skimming and whole genome sequencing. Its uh, uh, positive sides include that uh, it allows analysis of uh, multiple uh, single copy genes uh, simultaneously, uh, as also did the previous method. Uh, and when you are interested in uh, population level uh, genetics or genomics, then this is certainly the cheapest uh, method of choice for this type of analysis. However, uh, it uh, requires quite a laborious and uh, costly step of uh, target capture, which includes design of the target capture molecules, uh, hybridization uh, uh, processes, um, and it's uh, relatively costly, both uh, target capture probes, uh, chemicals, and sequencing uh, costs quite a lot. So uh, one could be happy to uh, have one specimen sequenced uh, for 100 euros. Um, here, especially the uh, manual analysis and uh, verification of individual genes and uh, taxonomic identities is uh, taking a lot of time. And also as uh, for uh, shotgun sequencing, there is a risk of database contamination because of molds and other airborne uh, contaminants. There is one uh, nice example of uh, use of this uh, technique for uh, sequencing multiple uh, markers of uh, Wolbachia directly from its uh, host genome, where the uh, Wolbachia DNA contributed roughly 10% of all uh, DNA. And last but not least, um, the most broadly used uh, and promising uh, method for DNA barcoding is utilization of uh, third generation amplicon sequencing. So it means that uh, uh, using third generation sequencing platforms such as PacBio or Oxford Nanopore, uh, one can run indexed primer amplicon sequencing. Uh, it has uh, many advantages compared to pre previous techniques especially it allows uh, analysis of uh, many uh, long marker genes uh, simultaneously. It has also uh, multiple options for parallel analysis of uh, hundreds or even thousands of uh, specimens when combining uh, those uh, indexed uh, primers. Uh, although the individual uh, runs of PacPio, less for Oxford Nanopore, are uh, relatively uh, expensive, it becomes uh, quite cheap for large batches of uh, uh, specimens or markers or both combined. The data analysis can be uh, automated to a very large extent. So, and the uh, time 
and, and cost of this analysis uh, could be equal to uh, 100 uh, Sanger sequences. Also, although the um, raw uh, read accuracy of TAC Bio and especially Oxford Nanopore are relatively low quality, uh, there are uh, many forms of uh, consensus calculation for nanopore and consensus sequencing options in a loop for uh, back bio, which make these methods uh, more accurate compared to Sanger sequencing. These methods also uh, offer extra capacities to distinguish different alleles or haplotypes, uh, which can be used to assess uh, a database interspecific variation, a potential uh, pseudogenes, and also uh, making hypotheses about uh, potential hybridization patterns in the specimens. The downsides uh, uh, are also there. For example, uh, this method requires multiple uh, indexed primers for uh, each specimen. So if you think of uh, 100 uh, paired uh, forward and reverse primers, which are all indexed, it would cost around uh, 3,000 euros. And uh, also, uh, as this method uh, enables analysis of large batches, then artifacts such as contaminating reads may very, very easily go unnoticed because of the high level of uh, automatization. And uh, one, uh, again, first paper where we used this method for uh, fungi, it was published by my colleague, uh, Kadri Runnel, uh, in Molecular Ecology uh, Resources. Here we targeted specifically uh, the different uh, uh, haplotypes in the marker genes. And uh, we saw that around 10 to 20% of uh, uh, fungal specimens contain multiple different ITS copies. So with this, I would like to conclude. And uh, if you like, uh, you can, uh, write questions to my email, uh, which you uh, will see on the first page of my presentation. So thank you. <laughs> um, apologies, I was just waiting for the cue from Sarah. Um, is Leilani still on call? Mm -hmm. All right, oh, she's there. Um, first of all, thanks all our speakers for staying on time and we're well within our allocated time zone, which is fantastic. Um, nobody ran over too much. So we're now moving into the second half of the session, which is Q&A. So thanks to all our speakers. And I see there is quite a bit of activity in the chat. And what we'll do now is just look through the chat, pick up some questions for our speakers. And if the speakers can all turn on their cameras so uh, we know you're here and um, able to hear and, and respond to the questions, feel free to unmute yourselves as well um, as we go through the questions. Um, just to echo Leilani's comment earlier about the taxonomic breadth that we've managed to capture in this um, Mahananga today has been really, really enlightening for some organisms like um, the invertebrates and even some of the vertebrates. We're really pushing that technology ahead and we can capture so much more specimens in, in each of these sequencing runs. While when it comes to things like plants, it's actually we're still navigating some of those initial hurdles of what is a good barcode? Is there a good barcode? Is there a universal barcode? And and listening to Rob's talk, <laughs> I'm less convinced there is a, a universal barcode to be had for plants. So I'm gonna start with you, Rob. Um, and I think there was a question and, and it's quite cheeky that I get to ask my own question first, but really just want to think a little bit about and, and ask more generally from the panel as well, as to is there a good way of creating 
a identification bar, a database for plants, either using a set of bar, set of gene regions or or a genome skimming approach. What's the verdict? I I think that well the the best case is is probably as, as Heidi's uh, brought up in the chat the um, uh, looking at the example of the Australian Gap project there where they've invested very heavily in uh, a particular um, set of um, uh, nuclear genes targeted by sequence capture. Um, I think I think if yeah if, if one was 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 committed to to the the <laughs> the, the the program as it were then then that's that's probably the the best way to go that that is um you know it's it's uh, the price is coming down of course it, it it's quite cheap i think probably there's room for improvement um you know maybe maybe like the most commonly used um um for angiosperms uh, bait set targets 353 genes Probably a subset of those would 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 you know could be shown to be more universal than others. Um, if you go down that approach, you get most of the information you can possibly get from the plastid. On a good day, you'd, you'd get the nuclear ribosomal DNA as well. So um, that's that's the kind of maximalist program. I think the minimalist program would be. Well, if you do a couple of thousand base pairs of plastid sequence and the um, a nuclear ribosomal DNA ITS, and they both agree with each other, then you know, ninety-five times out of a hundred, it's going to be right, and so you don't need any more information. <laughs> um, so, I think I, I, I think taking efficiency into account, there is a sort of horses for courses. Um, uh, debate to be had um you know uh yeah whether it's really necessary to go to that level of depth just as a a, a, a approach to everything mm, I think that's that's probably questionable mm -hmm. thanks so much for that Rob um another question that keeps coming up across the chat actually multiple times and I'll pitch it to Ange but I think everybody in the panel can probably contribute afterwards to this discussion around the quality and reliability and trustworthiness of data that is already available on online databases on these global like GenBank and BOLD. Um, Ange, what are your thoughts on that? Uh, yeah, so I think that the degree of curation differs across the different databases. And um, and I think that there was a question there about, you know, like whether there are any limits on who can upload and, and there aren't really. Um, there's sort of minimal criteria about potentially in, in some of them identifying, you know, an annotation of the sequence. Um, but there's definitely a lot of a lot of um, space that a lot of room for improvement in terms of the curation of the data. And there's a lot of misidentified species. Um, in the database quite often that's discovered in a kind of idiosyncratic nature where people just you know identify things that are misidentified um, as part of their ongoing research yeah so it's kind of it's only i guess it's only as reliable as as you know the people putting putting in correct information um, and there's yeah lots of space for additional curation i think we've all experienced um fantastic mismatches for data downloaded from GenBank for our own taxa. And I just wanted to pick on the other panelists if they wanted to add, because we've got a bit of variation in taxonomic expertise and maybe insect data is better, maybe plant data is better. Any thoughts from anyone else on quality of their um, particular tax of interest on GenBank, for example? Plants no good, Rob. <laughs> it, but, but with variation, as, as I said, um, I covered it just briefly. Probably didn't communicate very well. For um, ITS sequences for for New Zealand angiosperms, there's a lot in GenBank, and um, um, 
uh, the ones that are produced that that were produced out of um, Auckland University are generally pretty reliable. Some of those IDs would change or be debatable, but so I think I, I think you, yeah, you really have to look at 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 who put it in and whether they actually know the group or not. Mm -hmm. So utilizing some of that submission submitter information that Ange reflected on in her presentation as well. Actually, I have a second question for you, Ange, um, and I think you've there's been some responses in the chat already from others, but I thought I'd um, give you a chance to respond to it as well. Um, how do you propose it's, it might be possible to change bicultural and traditional knowledge notices and labels in databases such as GenBank or BOLD? Um, and I think there's a follow-up question around who manages the databases. And I think there's a little bit of a hint of a resp an answer there, right? Yeah, so somebody also responded to that and probably maybe knows a little bit more than I do about the fact that the some there, there are different databases got different rules about who can then go on and modify uh, information after it's been deposited. So I guess that's going to vary from database to database. And I think the area with the traditional labeling system is very much kind of an evolving space right now. So this requires the people that are developing those labels to actually get in and talk with the people that, you know, run the databases. And so I think that's another area that's under pretty active development right now. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I think I can probably just add to that uh, area under development, but I think Bold have been recently considering the possibility of adding um, a, at least some level of information around um, samples that were um, collected or collected in in accordance with accordance with local laws so that includes opportunity for biocultural labels but I don't think any of that is live yet I think this is some work Maui Hudson had initiated a year ago with with them um, but again as I said I think there is no really available opportunity and there are no metadata columns that specifically talk to uh, biocultural knowledge um, in, in this sort of uh, in context. One uh, thing to add to that, Manpreet, just quickly, is um, to, to think about also, as well as the infrastructure of the databases, there's some um, active evolution in this space going on at the journal side of things as well. So I've noticed that, for example, molecular ecology has now got a section where authors uh, have to provide information about um, sort of cultural engagement and collection permits and things like that as well. So if we kind of see a drive from the, the journals requiring these types of metadata information and cultural information being added uh, to the manuscripts, um, and that goes alongside deposition of uh, uh, of data to um, you know to these public databases. Then you know those two things might advance together. That's a really really good point, and I think yeah, in terms of one of the barriers when you consider having to do this type of work, you we forget that journals require so much open access you know, in terms of data deposition. So it's good to see that you know there might be a, a conversation between what. And the journals are requiring and then following up with what the databases might be able to respond with as well mm -hmm. uh, in terms of fulfilling those obligations. Um, I will keep moving through the questions because there's still a few to address. Ah, okay, so there's a question from Gertian, along with a potential for a copyright infringement of that very cool name of your um, Optimus Primer method, JJ. Um, I think there's been a few responses, but I'll ask this question anyway, um, because I think we're, in terms of thinking about the database that Aotearoa New Zealand might have, there's obviously a lot of resource sitting in museums and various collections and, and potentially to minimize additional collecting that might, you know, that might be limited or, or be dependent on resources or opportunities. One option is to go back to the museums and see what we can pull out from the, from the specimens that are already in storage. Um, and so what I wanted to ask around that was, um, are there other non-aquatic taxa for which a preservative-based extraction, a non-destructive preservative-based extraction might work? And do you have any examples of published work or, or what is your what are your thoughts on that? Um, so I have not done this besides uh, marine taxa, um, but based on how it would work is that as long as your specimen is stored in a preservative medium, the DNA will start leaching into the medium as soon as it's being 
put in there. Um, what we have seen is that um, there is a time required. So if you just put it in ethanol for a couple minutes, it won't work. So it needs quite a long time um, to make this work. Um, there will be most taxa, taxonomic groups who will be stored at least partially um, in a preservative medium. Mm -hmm. um, so there, there are, might be some like um, plants that won't have this at all mm -hmm. uh, because they're usually dried. Mm -hmm. um, so that might be a bit more tricky working with them or using this kind of approach just because that uh, reference data is not, not available. Um, and there are other groups that are working on different kinds of preservative media. So there is um, the group in Australia, CSIRO, that um, do a lot of work on formalin stored uh, specimens. And they have recently published, I believe last year, a paper on getting whole genome sequences out of formalin stored specimens. Oh, that sounds fantastic. We might have to get that reference off you later on and uh, post it as part of the Q&A that goes up online. I um, believe Ange um, wrote her name down in the chat. So it's Aaron Hahn who managed to do that. Yeah. Yeah, Perfect. I'll also put a link into the um, chat for you now, which is, the it's not up there yet, but it's our um, ERI seminars and the, the talk will be going up on there shortly. Oh, thanks so much for that, Ange. Um, now there's an interesting question that has come up and I think this is for everyone. So if anybody wants to just jump in and answer the question that would be great from the panel uh, of speakers. This is a question from Liam Barry. Um, what do you think is the way forward with recognizing data sovereignty for Tonga species while building up and sharing genomic data for research, conservation, biodiversity purposes? And are there any countries facing similar considerations? Any takers? A big question. I might have have a uh, put my five cents on. I'm not technically on the speakers panel, Manpreet, but I might um, contribute nevertheless. Um, one of the things, and this is not a this is not by no means a, a complete solution or a silver bullet or, or anything like that, but. Um, Certainly what Manaki Fenwa has done in, in terms of starting this process is we've attached biocultural notices to all our biological specimens. So if you access our, our collections databases, um, you get a notice, a stock standard notice that says there may be indigenous rights or interests associated with that specimen. And it's to your point, Ange, it's still, you know, that area is still under development. Um, what I can say is 3E, we have taken up the opportunity to attach biocultural labels to those, um, to the collections that, are, you know, have been collected from their respective rohe. That's Te Rorua, um, Whakatohia and Ngāti Maru. So, I mean, it's, it's, no, it's not a complete solution, but it's a start, you know, and you kind of have to start somewhere. Kapai Holden, thank you so much for that. Um, now, while we're waiting for more questions to come in, I just wanted to ask another cheeky question that I asked in the chat to Andrew. If Andrew's still on the call, I don't see his video up there. Um, but basically my question, and I should really know the answer because I was involved in this study, but I thought I'd ask anyway, because this has been one of the continuous um, issues with many other uh, taxonomic groups where some barcode, some primer set, a subset always works for some things, but not for others. So for the FC barcodes that were partially uh, more of instances of um, missingness was observed in your work and um, with, with in invertebrates, I suppose, um, was there a um, taxonomic bias to that? And if so, what would be your suggestion in terms of improving that um, recovery of the FC barcode for inverts? Um, <clears throat> there was some hint of a taxonomic bias to it. Um, it didn't seem it didn't affect the earthworms at all. Um, it mainly affected certain families. Well, most obviously it affected certain families of um, Coleop Coleoptera and Hymenoptera. Um, there were, for instance, there was one group of one family of beetles um, where there were ten specimens from that family, and none of them worked for the FC. The FC primers, 
-hmm. However, um, the distribution of taxa in the um, experiment was not really, <clears throat> um, I mean, it's quite uneven, so it's a bit hard to say for sure whether particular groups um, were, um, didn't work with that, with those particular primers with certainty. Um, but, it, but it sort of looks that way. Mm -hmm. um, and then if you wanted to resolve that or improve that, I guess you would, um, you might uh, just gather up the all the sequences from groups that didn't seem to work so well and just look at the primer compared with those and see if um, there's any obvious changes you could make to it. Um, I would also note that the primer, uh, one of the primers used for the FC is one of, is the same as has been used in DNA barcoding for a long time called LCO 1490 and it's been noted to have some deficiencies in certain other contexts as well. So it could just be that that's feeding coming through here as well. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you so much. I was just wondering if and um, the method that GJ you're developing around Optimus Primer to find that you know variability in that primer sequence would that fix some of this gap with with the invertebrates? Um, yeah, so we can look at the uh, primer binding regions. So with the uh, method that Andrew explained, so how I understand it for the FC primer is that he's using the original forward CO1 barcoding primer that is traditionally used, and mm -hmm. then a primer in the middle somewhere. So for the primer in the middle, we can definitely check how well that's working. Um, unfortunately, for the forward primer, because that is the traditional barcoding primer, there will be a lot of sequences that don't have that information at all. So that will there will be restricted to um, barcodes that will be going beyond that traditional primer uh, okay. binding region. But it's definitely something we can investigate. Cool. Thank you. Always looking for opportunities to improve how we how we do these things. Hey, and we have one more question from Susan Emmett, and this is to the the whole panel. Um, Susan says she is new to all things eDNA, but wondering if on these public databases, there's a way that barcodes can be verified by several people so that there is increasing confidence of accuracy, or if these barcodes are not verified, these can be considered potentially inaccurate. And that kind of gives a ring of how iNaturalists work, where multiple experts might look at a taxonomic classification based on a photograph and either call it verified or unverified. Um, do you think what will be the appetite for something like this on these uh, global databases? Any takers? Nobody steps up, I'm gonna peck on Ange. <laughs> There's, a, there's a response in the chat, Manpreet, <laughs> from oh, we'll Kieran. <laughs> We've got a response from Kieran. Kieran, if you're in the audience, do you want to speak up? It's always fun to pick on your own colleagues. Hey? Sure. I was um, just saying that in many situations, that kind of has been done. But because of the limitations on who can update the records, it's never actually reflected in GenBank. You know, you just tell your colleagues, you know, they're presenting their results and they say, oh, I got this really weird, like, hit on this one taxon with this sequence that I was interested in. And then someone in the audience will be like, ah, oh, ignore that. That's from this, like, spurious study in 1985 that did, like, you know, the first sequence from this organism. And it turns out that the voucher was switched around with some other things. So, yeah, just, like, ignore that and, you know, remove it from your database. But yeah, it never actually gets reflected in the the sort of live version. Mm -hmm. It's it's interesting because also we have to recognize these global databases are absolutely ginormous. The amount of effort that would go into kind of secondhand curating, like you would have to be very determined, uh, I guess, specialist in a particular taxon, and you'd you know really work on that to curate it, but to just like just imagining people, you know, and um, curating it after the fact, it, it would be such a mammoth task. But what is really important to reflect is there is this resource in experts globally that, you know, we could tap into for certain problematic taxa. And of course, for for like us moving forward with a particular a database for Aotearoa New Zealand, this is something we should think about 
um, tapping into because, you know, to do any of these large database projects, it takes a lot of work from everybody involved. And this just provides a second level of sanity check. Um, and, and yeah, I think researchers in Aotearoa New Zealand are very determined to get these things right. So hopefully we have a um, energized group that will help us curate this as well. Um, just having a quick look to see if there's any more new questions. Um, seems like we've covered almost everything, but if we haven't, if um, people want to continue discussing some of the issues around, you know, reliability of existing data, I'm, I'm keen to hear more um, from our panel experts on that. No, everyone's satisfied. We don't trust GenBank. <laughs> Nobody wants to uh, save its name. Um, um, I, I can um, weigh in on this a bit. Um, so it will be very difficult to do this during um, data depositing because there are already quite a few hurdles. Scientists are very busy. Um, so NCBI is set up so that it's as easy as possible to submit your sequencing data. However, if you're looking at barcodes and you have your sequences that you want to use, um, you can look at genetic distance between different barcodes to try and identify some of these misclassified sequences and then remove them from the database that you're finally going to use. Um, so you could do this after the fact. Having multiple people verify a barcode before it's being submitted, I think is going to be quite difficult to do. Mm -hmm. But what about after the like after it's been submitted, after it's been online? So right now, GenBank doesn't allow any retrospect retrospective changes post submission. And I think if if you do go for it, it has to be by the original submitter, which you know in many cases may no longer be working in that area, or or you know in GenBank, some records are quite old at this point. Um, and they may not be ac access to the person who originally submitted it. So in those sort of instances, you know, potentially having a, a at least more vis publicly visible option to say this is an erroneous record, even that might be more helpful than than nothing. Um, I believe there are lists uh, published for uh, records that might be um, containing some erroneous. annotations. Okay. There's. And ha -ha. Um, from Annette Bolton and Annette wonders how do we work around areas where we are finding new species but are unable to taxonomically describe them due to the expertise in the area do we rely on barcodes to ascribe molecular IDs and I think this might be a question for Rob talking about taxonomic expertise and, and the lack thereof sometimes um, if there's an entomologist online, um, this is a very live issue uh, in entomology at the moment. Um, uh, I think um, that, yeah, from a green plant perspective, relying on getting a different looking piece of DNA out of a specimen is a very poor basis for assuming a, a new species. Um, so I, I, I think that's that's just a, a bit of a no um, without some further um, consideration. Some people will describe a species based on very little information. <laughs> that's one, you know, uh, morphologically. I mean, a, 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 a species has to have a, a diagnosis and a description but it doesn't have to be a good one so <laughs> there's always the solution of slap dash taxonomy which some people do practice um but um yeah i think i think there's a there's a there's a yeah we uh some some people in entomology are looking to describe species just on the basis of of, of barcode sequences i i think there would be a very low tolerance for that in um in the botanical community that's very interesting um, around, you know, this this reducing accessibility to taxonomic expertise, while on the other hand, we're generating so much more genetic data these days. But, you know, like you need a, an ideal spot will be somewhere in the middle where you have equal parts of both, at least to at the beginning when you're still describing new species. And um, on a different note, 
I just want to highlight that actually that is not necessarily the viewpoint when it comes to microbial species. I know we're not really looking at microbes here, but as a microbiologist myself, I just have to say that we are allowed to um, describe new species just from genomes. This is a relatively recent change in the um, taxonomic code for microorganisms. And it's still, there's a lot of debate happening around it of whether this is ideal, whether it is not, what are we missing? Um, but it is starting to become a little bit more acceptable within microbes and, and maybe even a little bit around fungi to be able to describe new species or closely related species to what is already being described, um, especially when there's particular species that cannot be cultured um, at all. So for those species, it's much more acceptable to just describe a new species um, based on genetic data alone. But yeah, very limited to that microbial um, diversity rather than visible species. There, there is a related question. Oh, there's a couple of questions that have come through. I'll quickly um, go through um, Kieran's question. Um, <laughs> Kieran asks, isn't there a whole bacterium phylum described based on only sequence data? That is correct. Um, there are bacterial phyla and, and species and genera um, across all of bacterial diversity that are described only from um, genome sequences. And, and in fact, it has the, the ability to sequence things that we cannot isolate or culture has enabled discovery of many, many new microbial species. So yeah, that, that's correct. Um, so you can imagine the bacterial tree of life is an interesting place to visit. And um, we have a question from Kaimai Kapunga. Um, Tena Koto Itifano, Kaimai Kapunga here. We're new to the space of eDNA. Um, there are particular information within the space that helps with our conservation project. Would love to chat and catch up on anything we missed. <laughs> uh, this is a message from Tepuari. Thank you, Tepuari. We will be in touch about um, the uh, project that you are thinking about and more than happy to uh, catch up on, on, on the Wananga. This Wananga is recorded. And once we've tidied up the recording, uh, we will be uh, sending out a link to everyone to rewatch the recording of the Wananga. So yes, absolutely happy to share that um, call papa with you. All right. Um, it seems like we're coming to a natural end to the conversation. If there are any pressing questions from anyone in the audience, now is your opportunity to pop it into the chat and we'll ask our panel of experts. If there are questions that you think of later on, you can always email us or email Sarah and we can um, try and recognize those questions and ask our panel experts. Oh, one more question. <laughs> Fantastic. Um, Annette wants to know, she's really interested. What are the biggest concerns for EWI in terms of use of the DNA? Now, before I ask this question to our panel, I just want to reiterate that we did actually explore the um, perspectives that Evi Mari have on the use of DNA in a previous Wananga. It was our second Wananga in the series. The recording is available online and we can share it again when the recording for this Wananga goes out, but please check out our website. And um, with that, I will just put that question to the audience if anybody wants to take that on. What are the concern concerns for Evi Mari in terms of the use of DNA? Any takers? Usually Holden would chime in, but I understand Holden had to leave just previously. So if there's anybody else who wants to take on. I certainly can't speak for Iwi Mari, but uh, what's um, been expressed to me most often is uh, concerns around intellectual property uh, and um, uh, uh, respect over access to whenua and sampling. That's my experience. Oh, I see um, Te Pwari, you're, I think, mute. Kia ora. Thanks for that, Rob. I think you're mute, Te Pwari. Do you want to unmute yourself? or at least we cannot hear you here. Yeah, I think um, while they're figuring out 
sound issues. Mm -hmm. Maybe it won't work. Um, Rob, I, I have to agree. I think those are definitely some of the issues. Um, different EV come to it in a different way, but but just the idea of, you know, um that Tikanga associated with maintaining and managing DNA, which can be quite important for many EV Māori, um, is also something that has been um brought forth and, and was one of the key things that we explored during the previous Wananga as well. Um, so yeah, I, I would just redirect anyone who's interested in this Kopapa to that second Wananga recording. Um, I see some technical issues in the Kaimai Kafunga room. Any final thoughts from anyone else on this Kopapa generally and, and specifically to this question? Anyone else in the audience wants to speak up, please feel free to unmute yourself and tell us what you think. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I will just pop up my, I'll just pop up um, the slide for the upcoming one, Anga, just to give a little wee shout out on what we are up to next. Um, okay. All right, it sounds like we're coming towards the end of this session. And um, first of all, thank you everyone for your thoughts, for contributing, for participating, especially all of our speakers for preparing and presenting their talks today. Um, and thank you also my, to my lovely co-facilitator Leilani for running the first half of the session expertly. Um, and with that, I just wanted to um, share my screen very quickly this one to just flag the two upcoming Wananga in the series and um, the next one is on cross-project fertilization of best practice and um, here we will have an opportunity to learn from other projects and other often international programs of work where similar databases have been developed and generated and how did they um, kind of deal with some of the issues that we share with them or or new ways of um, managing, storing, curating, and sharing databases. And that, um, that next one is on the 25th of September. After that, we have the final and probably the most hotly awaited um, session on data governance and data sovereignty associated with a national DNA barcode reference database. Um, and then with that, I will just pass on to Leilani to do our closing karakia for the session today. Thank you, Leilani. Kia ora, Manfred, and I'd like to repeat the thanks, my, um, thanks to all of our speakers today and for everyone for participating. I will just close us out now. Um, pau hihiri, pau rārama, pau o te whakairu, whakaro, pau o te tangata, pau o te aroha, te pau e here nei i a tātou, mauri ora ki a tātou, Omie, huie, taiki e. Enakoto. Enakoto.